Hi there, I'm Lena Anani, and you're listening to She Wrote a Book, where I interview amazing women from all over the world who also happen to be published authors. I created this show to educate, entertain, and inspire you to be the voice you want to hear in the world. Did you know this episode comes with a free gift? It's a webinar for aspiring authors who want to learn my insider secrets on writing and publishing books. You can access this free training instantly at shewroteabook.com slash bonus. Now let's get started. You are listening to episode number 52 of She Wrote a Book, and today I'm interviewing Mary-Kate DeCrane, author of the book, No One Said Life Was Fair, How Bumpy Got His Name and Other Brief Encounters with the Criminally Inept, the Emotionally Bankrupt, and the Sobriety-Challenged Members of My Somewhat Twisted, Albeit Lovingly Dysfunctional Family. I love that subtitle. No One Said Life Was Fair is a poignant and humorous memoir about growing up in an alcoholic family. Mary-Kate DeCrane's debut offering takes her readers on a cathartic journey into her past. Mary-Kate DeCrane grew up on the south side of Chicago. She graduated from DePaul University where she won an award of merit for the work that she did on No One Said Life Was Fair. She resides in Romeoville, Illinois with her husband and daughter. Again, her book is called No One Said Life Was Fair, How Bumpy Got His Name and Other Brief Encounters of the Criminally Inept, the Emotionally Bankrupt and Sobriety Challenged Members of My Somewhat Twisted, Albeit Lovingly Dysfunctional Family. You can find the link to purchase her book in our show notes for this episode at shewroteabook.com slash 52. Mary Kate, I love your subtitle. I'm like trying not to laugh as I'm reading it. It's it's <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I thanks for being a guest today, and I'd love to know a little bit more about what inspired you to write this book. Well, um, honestly, my husband and I uh, were doing community theater, and my father had gotten hospitalized. My doctor gave him twelve hours to live if he didn't have his leg amputated, and he refused to have the surgery. And he was uh, at Cook County Hospital for two and a half months. And every day we would come to rehearsal and we would have another story to tell everybody about my father and his crazy antics at the hospital. And so, you know, one of my friends came up to me and said, you should write a book. And so I started thinking about it then um, and started, uh, you know, writing the story here or there. Um, But it it really um, took off after I got diagnosed with cancer when I was 30. My mother was 30 when she was diagnosed and she died when she was 35 and I was 15 and my daughter was only a year old when I was diagnosed so I thought what if I die too she's not going to know who I am and so I wanted to preserve all those family stories that my parents had told us and the stories that I would imagine myself telling her well that's that's pretty incredible I mean that's definitely a a great reason to put a book together um it's but it but it's interesting that you know it's it's not incredible that it came from a sad place, but um, so, uh, so so your subtitle has so much information in it, and I just kind of want to pull it <laughs> apart, right? Okay. Um, so I'm going to get nosy, and I want to know, like, who is the sobriety challenged members of your family? <laughs> um, well, actually, both my parents were alcoholics. Um, my mom started drinking when she was 10 and was an alcoholic by the age of 13, and my father started drinking when he was 12, and his degree, his disease um, progressed throughout his life. But they weren't the only two. Um, you know, when we were growing up, we had a lot of family members that would come live with us. In fact, um, uh, even though my dad was an alcoholic, he was everybody loved him. He was a, a really great guy, and he took in all the strays of the family. So we had my uncle, who was a drug addict, that came and lived with us. We had my cousin who was a, a drug addict who came and lived with us, another cousin who was a al- uh, recovering alcoholic. So, you know, we, we had this whole host of people in and out of the house that were suffering from addiction too, um, which was honestly a great lesson for us girls because I have two younger sisters growing up because we learned from their, their example of what not to do, you know. So it was it was very powerful, that message. Um, and That's interesting. Somebody. What? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, what what do you think it what do you think it um, what do you think happened for for things to click for you and your sisters? Like, what um, you know, some people don't learn by example, right? Some people don't learn by their environment. Why Why did you? What? Um, well, I think what what really turned it for us is uh, that was all during that time, and probably before you were born, but. Um, 
uh, Nancy Reagan was really pushing that Say No to Drugs campaign, and, you know, we were hearing that all the time at school, and, you know, kids were kind of, like, blowing it off and stuff. But then when you actually see someone who is struggling with a, an addiction to heroin, like my uncle, and, you know, can't even get up off the floor, you know, for a half hour because he's so high, you know, it 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 shows you, like, the absolute worst. You know, you're not just hearing about, oh, it's such a great drug, you should try it, you should get high, let's party. You see the what it does to people firsthand and and how it reduces them to, you know, steal for their drug and do things that they normally would never do. You know, we had family that would steal from us, <laughs> uh, including, you know, people that lived with us like my uncle. So uh, it, it was a, a, a very in-your-face life lesson of what not to do. Who who were the emotionally bankrupt people? Uh, that, that would be us, my, my sisters and I. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because we, we had gone through so, so much, you know, and it was always this roller coaster ride with my dad because, um, you know, he was very much uh, one of those people that would, would forgive and forget, you know. So, like, we would have a huge, horrible argument or, you know, because he was drunk, and the next day he wouldn't remember anything or he, you know, would just forgive you and you were friends again. So it was very much... Um, this roller coaster, you know, one day it's all turmoil and the next day we're all friends and everything's wonderful. And then, you know, so it's a, this big roller coaster ride. So you, you know, you kind of like felt all um, emotions all at once, all the time. And it was always chaos. There was always something crazy happening. Always, which I capture a lot in the book. Gosh, I can imagine. Um, I, I feel like at one point, it, this must have happened at a point in your life you're like, wow, the way I grew up, there are some holes in there that need to be filled. And I'm guessing, or I'm not going to guess, I'm going to ask you, what did you do to start uh, creating some transformations in your life to, 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 to create a better life for yourself, despite what despite your environment was? Um, I, I think a lot of that has to do with um, just self-determination, you know, finishing school, um, cause that was something I excelled at, um, just, uh, finding creative outlets, you know, the theater when I first got married, but, you know, writing this book was very cathartic, um, art, uh, several, um, other passions that I have, you know, arts and crafts and, you know, um, that kind of thing. But I absolutely love, um, being able to, put those expressions down on paper and have someone else feel what I felt uh, writing those stories so that people who are going through the same or similar situations can realize that they're not alone there, that there are plenty of other people that are going through what they're, you know, going through. Uh, right now in the, the U S there's 76 million Americans, about 43% of the population have been exposed to alcoholism in their family. You know, that's one in five adults, they say, uh, lived with an alcoholic while they were growing up. I mean, that's a lot of people. So I know people don't always talk about it, but if, if you go into a room and you ask people how many of them have been exposed to addiction or alcoholism in their families, you'd be really shocked at how many people raise their hands. I, uh, as, as part of what I did at DePaul for No One Said Life Was Fair, we did what they call a reader's ensemble. So I picked several people that I worked with or that I was in class with to come and read different sections of what I had written thus far for No One Said Life Was Fair. And it was for a genders class. And afterward, you know, when they, the, the class would ask questions and whatnot, and it was only supposed to be a half hour long. We were there for the entire class period. And they discussed after we left for two more class periods. But everyone that I had asked, to stand up and, and read for me had addiction in their family. And when we asked the class, almost every single person raised their hand. And so I, I know it's a topic that touches a lot of people. And the, the hardest wow. thing for me when I was growing up was feeling so alone that no one else knew what we were going through. And, you know, there's a lot of denial and a lot of, you know, hiding what's going on at home because you're afraid that someone's going to find out what's going on and they're going to break up your family. You know, that was a real fear for me growing up. 
So, I mean, because we, we did have DCFS called on us, you know, so um, it's it's scary thinking that your family might fall apart. Wow, absolutely. So the, some of the stories are pretty intense that you've experienced. I want to know, why did you approach it as a humorous memoir? Uh, because my problem with the way um, Hollywood project, portrays alcoholism and addiction is they make it kind of like a almost villainous. You know, my father was a really, really funny guy. You know, and he tried to have fun in between all the, the craziness, you know. Um, and my childhood wasn't all bad. And we really, I mean, there were some times we really enjoyed ourselves or like afterwards would laugh. You know, like there was one time my, my dad and my uncle came home and they were both full of mud from head to toe. And, you know, started ripping off, the, asking if the police had been there. And they started ripping off their clothes and throwing them in the wash and changing and telling us, you know, um, if anybody asked where they've been, you know, they've been here the whole day and all this other stuff. And it turned out a police officer was writing a guy a ticket. And my dad tried to drive close enough to him so my uncle could hit him in the butt because he had his butt sticking out. And he missed. So they went around the block. And he, he got close enough where he kind of nudged him, and he fell into the car and on top of the guy who you know, he was riding a ticket to onto his lap. And they were, like, you know, being chased all over the neighborhood for what they did. You know, obviously the cop didn't see the humor. Um, but that was, like, a daily event. You know, I would come home, and something crazy like that would be happening. So, you know, there was a lot of – it was – it may not have been funny at the time, but afterward, you know, we laughed about it, so – very interesting. Cool. So um, what do you love most about being an author? Connecting to other people um, on a level that uh, that's very personal. Uh, talking about, you know, things that happened in our childhood that a lot of people can identify with some of those things. You know, obviously maybe not the, the fugitive story there, but um, – and and – helping them to, to realize that, you know, they're not alone. Somebody else has experienced this as well. Uh, it, it's an incredible outlet. I, I absolutely love it. I'm really looking forward to writing something a little less dark, uh, like a comedy, that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully my next uh, fiction book, that'll, that'll be uh, a little lighter material. <laughs> Awesome. Very cool. Well, Mary-Kate, thank you so much for being our special guest today. We will have a link to your book in the show notes for this episode, and our listeners can find that at shewroteabook.com slash 52 to learn more about our author and her humorous memoir. So thanks again, Mary-Kate, for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to She Wrote a Book. If you enjoyed this episode, then subscribe now so you can automatically get access to all new episodes. And feel free to share your inspired thoughts with us in the comments, too. I'd love to hear from you. Are you ready to write your own book? Get started now with my quick and concise webinar so you can learn my insider secrets on writing and publishing your own book. Claim your free gift now at SheWroteABook.com slash bonus. Until then, may you always feel good and make magic. Feel good, make magic now. Lena and Nani will show you how. Ignite that wisdom inside of you. And show the world what you do. To publish, write, and promote.